Today we're going to be talking about one of those fundamental truths that we're going to be discussing on Wednesday during our Bible study and after our Bible study about healing. We believe in divine healing. We as a church want to tell you that God's word is still valid. You look through the Bible, and we as a church have the habit of reading the Bible. That's an important thing for a church to do, for a believer to study and read the Word of God. And every day, you're a part of that Bible reading. You're getting that information so that as a church, we read through the entire Bible. And I will challenge you to ever find an expiration date on the Bible. It doesn't have one. What Jesus did, the days that he walked, are still, a val are still valid. Jesus' salvation was not just for the first century church. wasn't for the first generation church. Salvation is still here today. Everything that we find in the Bible is about us today. And we're going to be talking about divine healing. Salvation, as well as other miracles, are a part of a promise of God. And you know one of the things that God is invested in is fulfilling his promises. God never lies. God never tells you something that he later on decides, oh, I'm not going to do that after all. That's one of the wonderful things about having an omniscient God is that everything he already knows in the future and he can never make you a promise that he can't complete. You and I may be those kinds of people that say, I'm going to do this. And then later on that next day, something else happens, which makes it impossible for you to complete that task, right? But that's out of your control, we say. It is circumstances beyond my control made it so that this was going to happen. But you know what? There are never circumstances beyond God's control. God is in charge, and he is still in the business of healing us. Every first Sunday of the month, also one of the, the, the 16 truths that we're going to be talking about this next Wednesday uh, is that we receive and we partake in communion. And frequently while we're partaking in that communion, when we get to the part about the body of Christ, I make reference to a text that 1 Peter 2.24, it has it right here. He's actually quoting out of Isaiah 53, but it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And when we are partaking in communion, I will often take an opportunity, make the opportunity to pray for the sick. And at the conclusion of this service today, we're going to be praying for sick. But we want to understand what God is doing amongst us and why he still heals. You know, some people say, oh, he heals me so that I can go out and enjoy another round of golf. He's healing me because I get to do uh, this other thing. We're going to be talking a little bit about that in just a few moments. But I want to note something for you here. In Peter's verse, in verse 24, he links two things together. These things in the heart of God are forever linked. And I want to remind you that the greatest thing, greatest miracle as far as God is concerned, is when you move from spiritual death to spiritual life. Sometimes we think of some miracle, some healing as the greatest thing. And I will tell you that I have had opportunity to watch people who have never walked in their life get up and walk for the first time. I have watched the surprise on the face of a young man who had never heard anything in his life, born deaf, hearing for the very first time. I know what that surprise, that, that wonder is all about. But you know the greatest wonder, the greatest thing that we could ever receive is the fact that we are forever saved and we have been moved from spiritual death to life and Peter links these two together notice when he decides to quote Isaiah he says at the end by his wounds you have been healed but in what context notice it's in context of salvation it's in context of relationship with Jesus and look what it says he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. The reason that we are healed is that we might live for righteousness. It's not our healing so that we can go out and be the greatest drug dealer ever and, uh, and uh, cause Chapo to uh, uh, feel like he had lost complete control because we are there now. 
No, it's because God has a plan for us. So let's go to our main text today. We've been reading in the book of Acts, and here we are in chapter 9, verse 32. It says, as Peter traveled about the country. Now, I have, one, I have a question here. What do you think he was doing when he was traveling about the country? Was he just on a sightseeing journey? He was out there taking pictures. He said, wow, look at this picture. Wish you were here. You know, he was on vacation? I don't think so. There's only one reason that this is part of Scripture as far as my mind can realize, and that's because Peter had heard Jesus say, go and make disciples of all nations. He was going around preaching the gospel. He says, as Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Now it says he found the man. Now how do you find a man that's been bedridden for eight years? Well, you have one of two choices. You can go to his house or the man can show up where you're at. I tend to think that it's probably the latter. As Peter is going around, you know, it would be impossible for him to go in and visit every single household. But as he is going around, he begins to preach as he's ministering in the city there and in the church there. And he finds this man who'd been bedridden for eight years. And as Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately, and he has got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him. And notice what the response was to the healing. I told you that we're going to be elaborating on the fact of salvation being a key element in our healing. And why can I say that? Here again. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him. And what it happens? They turned to the Lord. We're going to go on reading. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples, who? The disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the windows, uh, all the widows, not the windows, the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then, they, then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. Now notice what it says next. This became known all over Joppa. And what happens? And many people believed in the Lord. Many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. So here we see what Peter is going around doing. Because we have signs and wonders. As a matter of fact, Jesus promises these things will accompany you. As we go around doing what God has called us to do. Not what we want to do. Not going out and saying, you know what, I need healing because I have tennis elbow and I want to play more tennis. Now, don't get me wrong. God has nothing against tennis. But we have to understand the purposes of God. His highest goal is always toward salvation. Now, don't get me wrong. He loves us so much that he wants to heal us. And he wants our elbow to get better. For sure. But notice how frequently in text after text we are going to have the connection of divine healing with salvation. Because God is showing himself strong amongst us, amongst the world, and they're going to see something, and they're going to say, I want that Jesus as well. Because God's highest priority, the reason why he heals you rather than just taking you home, 
Wouldn't that be wonderful? We all pray. Every time you get sick, God, just take them home, and they drop dead. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You see a lot of people coming to know the Lord that way? Go to that church. If you get sick, you'll die. <laughs> Everyone in the world would be saying, wow, let's run over there, you know? The reason for our healing is a testimony to the rest because God wants everyone in the world. His plan, His will is that none perish, but that all come to repentance. This is one of the reasons why divine healing is available to us today because He is still in the business of showing Himself strong. Now we're going to get into, a, in just a few moments, into the reality that there are times when we pray for sick and they are not healed. And we're going to answer that question in just a few moments. But if you notice here, Peter was traveling around. His purpose was preaching the gospel. One of the things that the church has to have as a highlight and a point of, of reference always in their lives is that I live to preach Jesus. Paul did not have a problem with healing people. He would lay hands on people. He would have a handkerchief go away and they would come and, and have their divine healing instantly. Now, what was that saying? But Paul also said, for to me... To live is Christ and to die is gain. Everywhere he went, his highest priority was to win the lost, disciple them, and make them into people that could represent Jesus on earth. The reason why he didn't have a problem healing people and he didn't lack faith is because he had the order correct. God's plan is a plan of salvation. The highest goal of God is that your neighbor, your, your co-worker, your fellow classmate if you're in school, all of the people around you, your family, your friends, everyone come into relationship with him. And the, to that end, he even offers divine healing. Divine healing. And we're going to get, in just a few moments, more detail. But here, Peter met a person of faith. How can I say that? Because I don't believe Peter visited him in, ho in his house. It says that he's been in his bed for eight years. Now I want to tell you, if you've been sick for eight years, what will that mean? You've probably tried everything. Remember the story with Jesus in his day? There was a little old lady who had been suffering from bleeding problem for 12 years. And she snuck up behind Jesus. You remember the story. But what does it say about that lady? said that she had spent all she had, and rather than being better, she had grown worse. That's what happens. When we don't feel well, we can, we, can, we can use all of our resources to try to feel better. And I have to imagine, in eight years, this guy, who had been bedridden, had had all of his friends come and say, Oh, I heard of a new doctor. Maybe he can do something for you. It's just natural, isn't it? Because when you have friends that love you, family that love you, they're going to come along and say, oh, maybe this will work. And he's tried every new medicine out there. He's gone to every specialist as well as all the quacks out there. That's what we do, don't we? And then he hears, Peter is in town. And Jesus had healed all of these people. And now we're seeing powerful signs even with Peter. And this guy who had been bedridden for eight years finds his way to where Peter is. And Peter looks at him. And he can see, you must have faith. How would he know that? He bothered to get out of bed and show up. He was there. And Peter sees him. He recognized that man. And you know what? I have, one, I have a question for you. Why do you think God didn't heal him the first day? Isn't it possible that God heal us the very first day we get sick? It is. Well, I could go on to another question. How about... Our, oh, the wonderful story, the joyful story of Job. We're reading it right now. Why is it that God didn't intervene and heal Job before the sores broke out? Why didn't God intervene and heal before all of these other calamities that befell Job? Wasn't it because God had a greater plan than just with Job. 
He wanted to show something about his nature to not just Job, but to other people. And we, to this day, are still reading his story. We are understanding that God wants us to not just have head knowledge of him, but to know him personally. And that interaction, that encounter that Job had with God was worth all of the suffering that he had gone through. And the same thing I could say about this man. And he has, he is eight years suffering, paralyzed. He's in bed for eight years. And you could say, oh, that's terrible. But why would God have waited eight years? Because in eight years, everyone in the community knew him. If God had come into the rescue the very first day... No one would have said, oh, wow, God is sure glorious. I want to know him too. No, this guy, Aeneas, woke up that morning and felt a little sick. He prayed, and now all of a sudden he's 100%. You think the whole community is going to come to know Jesus because of that? There's times when we pray, and I said I'm going to get to why sometimes we're not healed. There's times when we pray, and because we don't know it all. We don't know what God's plan is. We may not be healed. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't plan on healing us. I would propose that perhaps this man had already prayed every day for eight years. And what made that a special day? Because that was the day when God was going to get the glory. And that every single day person in the community was going to turn to him and say, I know now that God is real. Let me give you an example. Years ago, I was 17. So it was just like yesterday. Years ago, my brother was in an automobile accident. And um, some of you are new and you haven't heard the story. Some of you have heard this story before. Bear with me. And that accident broke several bones in his body. Amongst that was his spinal column. And uh, he was put into a wheelchair. That first, couple, that first week, week and a half, he was in traction in, in a situation at a special hospital and on this, this bed that rocked him back and forth to try to keep him from getting bed sores. And at 17, I knew these aspects of God. And I was negotiating with God because I was going to go and pray for my brother. I was going to pray that God heal him in that instant. And I told God all of the right things. In case God didn't know, if God were to heal my brother this day, he could turn and be a preacher even on his high school campus. There would be revival in all of our city. I, I, I was very convincing to myself. I marched myself in there having convinced myself this was God's absolute plan. Right? And I laid my hands on my brother. I prayed for him. And you know what? Nothing happened. And I went out of there really frustrated, angry at God for not doing the right thing. Isn't that how we feel sometimes? The right thing. And then a year went by. We were in Mexico. And I once again had an opportunity. There was a young man in his early 20s that was brought into a crusade that we were doing. And while I was preaching about the power and the glory of God, I saw him being carried in. He didn't even have a wheelchair. And God spoke to my heart, and he said, when you're done with this, at the end, pray for him. I want to heal him. I told God, no, thank you. I know that doesn't work. I already had the experience. And so I kept preaching, and, and I was convincing everyone of the glory and the power of God while I was arguing with God in my mind, saying, no, thank you. I concluded the message, inviting all those that wanted healing to come forward. And there were about 30 some odd people that came forward and were, were, were there. And I was grateful that I required them to come forward. And after all, he couldn't walk, so how could he come forward? 
Well, his dad was with him, and he grabbed his, a chair, put it up in front, and then carried his son up in front. He was at this end from my, my perspective, and so I started at that end. I didn't even want to get to him because I knew that God doesn't do that anymore. I already had the experience with my brother. And I prayed, and you know, I, I mean, I have all kinds of faith for a person that tells me that they have a headache. Had all kinds of uh, uh, other issues. Oh, my husband is home, and he's, he's a drunk, and, and he treats me like, I, you know, I, I prayed with all kinds of faith. And I prayed for a long time, letting people leave, and especially hoping he would go away too. I finally got to the very end, and some of you have heard the story before, and um, I had no faith at all for him. And so I just extended my hand, and I said, why don't you get up? I reached my hand out to him. And I fully expected him to say, you know what, because my legs don't work. That's why. But to my surprise, he got up for the first time in his life. And I thought... That's interesting. <laughs> a few months later, I had an opportunity to visit the church that was hosting that event. And, and I, I saw him walking along the road. And, and I, I said, Beto, why, why don't you get in the car? And, and, and he says, no, I, I'm out here walking. This whole community needs to see what God does. Because it's about bringing salvation, not just about our own personal feelings. And if I start to go back and I start to reflect on my brother, for example, my brother was in an automobile accident, and I don't want to sound crass or, or aggressive, but now looking back, I have to wonder if that wasn't an absolute loving touch from God at that time. My brother was walking in a very dangerous way. He was getting involved in drugs and selling drugs. I have to wonder if God didn't put him in one spot and just simply say, because I love you. Divine healing is about love. We're going to get there. And, and, and I, I'm starting, even in my mind, to think, well, for the first 20 years, my brother didn't want to have anything to do with God. But now he's come to the Lord. And, I'm, and, and, and you know how long of a process this would have to be for me because this was such a tr uh, traumatic event in my life as a teenager to pray with all the faith and then him not get up. And now I'm coming back around and I'm saying I'm praying for him every single day because perhaps now, after more than 30 years in a wheelchair, Everyone knows. He's come to know the Lord. He's going to live for Jesus. Maybe now is the day. And this is what had happened here with Aeneas. We, we see that the reason for Aeneas' healing is that God loves. God loves Aeneas, and he loved the city. He wanted to do something that brought salvation, brought an understanding of who he is to everyone. And this is one of the key elements of salvation, but of healing. The reason why God does the things he does is because he wants us all to know him, to know him. You know, there are times in our lives that we're not healed and we don't understand the reason. And perhaps it's because God knows tomorrow more than we do. Perhaps it's because the next thing that's going to happen isn't how we plan it out because we don't have control. Remember I just said, I can make you a promise, but sometimes I break it because I have circumstances beyond my control tomorrow. But God never has that. He knows what tomorrow has. He knows what tomorrow brings. That means that what do we do? We pray for their healing now because we don't know. But we never give up. You may be healed instantly today. And if you come into this place sick, we're going to pray for you. Because God is still in the business of divine healing. And you know what? I have seen 
and we have experienced it. There's been times because every single week, week in, week out, on Wednesday afternoons in our Bible study, I ask for prayer requests. And there is one person, Nancy, who reminds us of the same person over and over and over again, it seems like. But actually, they've changed. Because one person that was over and over and over again after three years was healed. Why, wasn't, why didn't God heal at the beginning of the three years? I don't know. But I know God knows everything. And his timing is perfect. And so she continues to bring up as faithful as, a, as a, a, we can be. And we say, we're going to pray. We're going to pray. And you know what? So faithful is Nancy to remind us of the same people that when on the rare occasion she can't be in Bible study, we still remember to pray for her prayer request because they're there every single week. That's who we need to be because God is the one in charge. God loves us. He knows everything. And in his love, he also allows times of suffering, in times to put us in our place, times to get everything else in order. Because God wants the world to come to know Jesus. You know, even in Jesus' day, there was a time when Jesus himself did not do many healings. In Matthew 12, at the beginning, he had already done two miracles in this chapter. And the people of the city come to him and they say, show us a sign. You know what? Jesus looked at him and said, obviously you're not going to believe anything. All you want is a spectacular thing, but it's not going to transform you. It's not going to change your life. I'm looking for people whose lives are going to be forever changed, transformed. Not just people who are going to go back out and play another round of tennis or golf. Again, I don't have a problem with those two things. But that is not the focus of our lives. The focus is the transformation that God has done in our lives to go out and then preach the gospel to other people. If you say, I want to be a preacher of righteousness, but I can't move right now. I can't get out. I want to tell you, God wants you to go out and also be there. Look at what happens in this day. Matthew 12, 39 says, He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. There's times when God looks at our circumstances and says, nope, because it's not going to accomplish my purpose. Now there are some people who automatically, and just by who they are, they know the purposes of God. Because they spent so much time. You know what? There are times when I can convince myself that God wants something, and it's really just what I want. How many ever are emotional? So we have to have confidence that God is the one that knows best. That God knows best. We were to move and talk about this Tabitha or Dorcas as she was healed. Notice what it says there. It says that everyone gathered around from the church and the disciples were mourning and wailing and wishing. And, and, and they sinned people to get Peter and come back. One of the things that we need to understand about healing, divine healing, is that it's a matter of authority. It's a matter of authority. And when we go out and we're sharing the gospel of Jesus, and I see this over and over again in areas and locations that they don't know anything about Jesus, I share the gospel and I'm amazed at how many healings are taking place amongst them as God proves who he is amongst those people. Then I go back to the church who, who should now learn to walk by faith that they just know God exists and, and all of a sudden those same healings I don't see as often and so forth. I had one pastor in, in California ask me why I thought that God was doing healings in Mexico and not in his church. I said, maybe God's telling your church, do the work of the ministry. That you don't have to constantly try to put God to the test. I don't know. But Jesus comes in Matthew 28. He says, before sending out his disciples, again, this is about evangelism, about sharing the gospel. He says, before he says, go and make disciples of all nations, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Healing is a matter of authority. When you go out and you are witnessing, I want to encourage you, divine healing is a part of who we are. 
You talk to somebody about Jesus and they say, oh, I'm too sick. Oh, I have this problem. Take the opportunity to lay hands on them and pray for them. And you know what? It's going to be very hard for that person who just was healed instantly to say God really doesn't exist. Take advantage of the opportunity. Because that's a fact. It's a doctrine. We can, we can trust God in divine healing. But it's a matter of authority. And when you go out and you are sharing the gospel, God, Jesus, has given you authority. He says, all authority has been given to me, so now go. So when we go out, we are walking with the authority of God. But now notice in the second portion of the scripture, we have this lady named Tabitha who passes away. And the disciples don't all gather around and just pray for her. They sin for Peter. They're saying, look, we are in a church. We're in a different situation. And the church has been a established by God. We already know him. It's not a matter of our salvation. We want to submit ourselves to authority. Matter of fact, James says it like this in chapter 5, verse 14. Inside the confines of the church, and I'm not talking about the building, but rather the people. James says, is anyone among you sick? Then let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. He doesn't say call anyone you want. Because it's a matter of authority, and there's authority that's been established in the church as well. And so he says, put yourself under the authority that Jesus has established. Let them call him, the church to pray over them, and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. It's a matter of authority. So inside the church, we also see healings taking place. But again, if you look at the example with Tabitha, the example shows us that the end result, even in the church situation, is that God brings salvation to the community. That's what we read. That as a result, many people in her community came to know the Lord. The reason why we are healed the health, if you will, was something that God wants to do in the city. And salvation is the greatest healing you could ever have. God doesn't just heal one. You know, there's been times when we've had uh, an invitation for people that needed healing to, to come up front. And, and, you know, all of a sudden 15 people are up in front. And I say, oh, well, you've overwhelmed God. He couldn't possibly do that much. And people laugh. Because he can there's nothing that overwhelms God. And when he does one thing, he doesn't want to do just one thing. He understands the ripple effect, the causal, uh, uh, trial and causal effect of everything that happens. When one is healed, this will happen, that will happen, this other thing happens. He understands it all. That's why he speaks healing. Because his goal is to bring salvation is to bring salvation. In Christ, we move from death to life. You know, our health is not for us just to make our own plans. You know, I want to get better so that I can go and, and take a cruise to Alaska. I want to get better because I've always want, dreamt of, of learning how to surf on the, uh, in Maui. You know, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, all of those things are great. But God can trust us. There's some people, they go to Maui, they learn to surf, and they never mention Jesus once. There are other people that end up in Maui, and like Peter, everywhere they go, they're preaching the gospel. Who do you think God's going to trust with the gospel? The ones that are speaking. So why do you want to be healed? Is a key element, I believe, in this. As the church member. Those outside the church, that's another thing, to prove God and who he is. But within the church, why do you want to be healed? Why do we want to be healed? Oh, so that I can sleep better at night. Okay. And I'm not saying that God doesn't care about those things. But I do know that there's one thing that God cares about above all others. And that's the salvation of everyone that you know. That they would come into re to relationship with him. If you aren't evangelizing today in the church... You can't tell me that if God were to heal you, you'd all of a sudden start. You know, you go out and you start telling your doctor about Jesus today, church member, guess what? 
There's nothing, no sickness is going to be able to hold you back. And you may have all of these doctors who have got, done all kinds of confirmed studies showing, proving just how incurable you are. You know what? God just shows up. We have a young boy, not part of the children's ministry, but is related to the children's ministry. And um, Aker is about, well, about a year old, about a year old. And um, his brothers, his family, children, come to the children's ministries on, on Saturday with Maida. And Maida, along with Vince, has gone in and because this boy, it, 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 he's still going through studies, tests. Well, it looks like he has cystic, cystic fibrosis. And with climate, with the climate or the, the weather changing and, and bronchitis and all of the things that, that go hand in hand with having a stiffening of the lungs, his prognosis isn't very good at all. And his mother, his grandmother who lives there in the house, uh, they don't come to the church. And I told Maida, just go in and pray for him. Just go in and pray for him. You know, when the doctors come back and say, boy, I, I guess we missed that diagnosis, go in and tell the parents, go in and tell the grandparents about the glory of Jesus. Now, we're not the ones that heal. It's Jesus that heals. But if we understand why he's doing what he's doing, because we know, not because of our own ingenuity, we're not trying to manipulate, because Scripture tells us the highest priority of God is the salvation of everyone. What he does, the reason why he sent Jesus born in a manger, the reason why Jesus lived and died on a cross. The reason why Jesus rose from the dead. The reason why the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost to, to equip the church. The reason God does everything is to bring salvation to the world. To convince us of our sins. And that we would walk in relationship with him. Jesus still heals and works miracles today. The question is not whether Jesus can heal us, but rather whether we're ready to work in the harvest. Because that's why Jesus is going to heal us. It's to bring salvation. It's to bring others into relationship with him. Notice right here this last text in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and following. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Notice how he connects it again. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Those two are forever connected. And then if you read on in verses 36 and 37, it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Jesus still has compassion on us. When we are sick, he still has compassion on us. The reason why he heals us, he still has compassion on us. But notice what he says. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He was out preaching the gospel and healing people, and he said the workers are few. Why was he healing people, I wonder? Hello? He says the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And you know, I understood this even as a teenager. I went in and negotiated with God that, God, if you do this, all these people will come to know Jesus as a result of healing my brother. I understood the concept. But my timing, and I say this, my timing wasn't right. Because God's timing is always right. 
You may be here today and you say, oh, but I understand that. I want to be a part of that. I want to have that relationship too. Great. So God can heal you. Will he heal you? I'm going to believe so today. But if he doesn't, you know what that means? We'll pray again tomorrow. And we pray again the next day. And we pray again the next day. And when his timing is perfect, we're going to be in agreement with him. Because God still heals. Bow your heads with me, if you will.